Hello and welcome to Differential Discussions. I'm Melissa. And I'm Dave. And today we're going to talk to you about red cell morphology, but we're actually going to go over all of the different red cell morphologies. So not looking at a particular disease state. And we'll be using uh, visual aids in the form of photographs, right, to, uh, to accomplish this. So pretty neat. Um, so what do we have in front of us, Melissa? How would you describe this field? It's a normal old field. Normal field, right? Yep, I agree. And uh, what I see that makes it normal, I see uh, erythrocytes with a one-third central pallor, um, you know, round biconcave discs, right? Yep. Yeah, absolutely. This field's great because you can tell that the chromia or the amount of hemoglobin mm -hmm. is normal, so normal chromia. Um, if you can't really tell size as much from this field, there's no measurement tool, there's no nothing to compare it to, but you can tell at least they're normal chrome. Yeah, that's very true. Looks about right, but no visual anchor for us yeah. to really dictate size. Yeah, and you know, after a while, you just kind of get used to it and you're like, oh, these are normocytic. I can tell just from experience kind of thing. But in the beginning, you really do need that anchor or something to tell you this is normal acidic. So what kind of visual anchor could we have that could help us, you think? <laughs> so classically, we're, we're taught, right, that the, uh, the uh, nucleus of the lymphocyte is approximately the size of a, of a normal erythrocyte. Yeah. And you want to use a resting lymph. Yes. Not a very reactive, important. a resting lymph. Yes, very important. Reactive lymphs can get quite large. We haven't done reactive lymphs yet. Hmm. Okay. One day, one day we'll get to that. Um, and, and in my experience, the lymph is the lymph nucleus is always just a, a little bit bigger, but it's really close approximation uh, to the size of the red cell and gives you a general idea. Um, yep. Certainly when the red cell is far bigger than the lymph nucleus, you know for sure you're looking at uh, a macrocytosis and mm -hmm. far smaller a microcytosis. Yeah. And I think this is a good field because if you look here, this guy is about this size. Maybe a hair smaller, but he's about that size. But this guy is really about this whole lymphocyte size, not just the nucleus. So you know this this cell is a macrocyte versus this cell is a normal site. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. So that's the way you want to use the lymph, especially in the beginning when you're first learning macro, micro, normal. And one of the things that I think we see often is uh, if we ignore the lymph in the field and we just compare those two red cells to one another, it's difficult for you to make a decision here. So it's, it wouldn't be uncommon for a student to say, hey, that cell is microcytic mm -hmm. because they're comparing it to a large red cell. So without that frame of reference, you've now gone down a path and made a decision that's incorrect. Right, yep, you see that a lot in the beginning. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So now that we've taken a look at normal cells, normal red cells, let's look at some of the abnormal shapes. The fun stuff. Yay. Acanthocytes. Yeah. So um, acanthocytes, I believe we've seen in uh, one or two of our videos. Um, and acanthocytes, I think it describes as having uh, uneven projections, right? Um, and we'll see uh, commonly confused with echinocytes, which we'll get to a little bit later. And schistocytes. And schistocytes. Very good. That's the big mm -hmm. three. Yep. So acanthocytes, uneven projections. So they're not even all the way around. Mm -hmm. The projections themselves, some are larger, some are wider, some are really small, some areas are completely flat. Yep. Pretty classic. A classic acanthocyte. Ooh, agglutination. So yeah, agglutination, uh, I, again, we've covered an, uh, an agglutination, a slide with agglutination on it. Um, and so <clears throat> with agglutination, we have red cells sticking together um, without, some, uh, without an organization. So 
Um, one of the things that I think students learn to differentiate this from is Rouleau. And so Rouleau is a more organized stacking, sort of like a stack of dimes where um, the broad side of the red cells are, are sticking together. Jelly donuts on top of jelly donuts sort of feel to it. Whereas agglutination is more this three-dimensional um, indiscriminate clumping. Yeah. yeah. And it's caused by antigen antibody interaction. So it's very particular. When you call agglutination, you're telling the physician there's antigen antibody interaction. Right, right. As opposed to Rouleau, which doesn't, uh, that, that uh, uh, I don't want to say chemistry, but that, that biology is separate. And, and, and so yeah. you're sending two different messages. So it is important that you're able to distinguish. Yes. Yep. Ooh. Basophilic so, stippling. This, yeah, this, I know there's some exciting morph here, but we're focusing on the <laughs> So yeah, basophilic stippling is one of our uh, red cell inclusions that we can have. Yeah. And it represents RNA. RNA. What's that, right? Yeah. So uh, this is RNA staining in the cell. And um, I think one of the things that about, a couple of things about basophilic stippling can be really easy to miss. Yeah. So when I'm tracking through a field, I'm oscillating the fine adjustment uh, to pick up things like this. Cause you could have a field in focus Yep. but not have the basophilic stippling in focus. A lot of times it looks like polychromasia. Very true. Absolutely. And then you play with your fine tune, and then you can actually see, oh, there's just basophilic stippling. Mm -hmm. It becomes yeah. prominent. Yeah. And so um, what would this be confused with, do you think, in your experience? Uh, most so often? basophilic stippling is usually confused with how old jolly bodies or Pappenheimer bodies and the, the, again, the big three inclusions, you want to make sure that you know the difference between the three. And we'll look at hollow jollies and paps again as we, as we go on. Sure. With basophilic stippling, it can be either fine, very, mm. very small dots, evenly spread throughout the cell. So that's one of the things about basostip is that it's evenly spread throughout the cell. Or it could be really coarse and, mm. you know, really fine basophilic stippling, you can see it in a a bunch of different things but thalassemia is one that you could see it in but coarse is really more prominently found in lead poisoning mm -hmm. very so. good yeah and that's a great boc question i say this i'm a broken record with this but uh but coarse or punctate basophilic stippling is a uh, heavily association uh, with lead poisoning yeah. yep they're not pathognomonic but it's heavily associated <laughs> mm. the um uh so Pappenheimers, um, we'll see a little later. Yep. They are not, so this is generally a random distribution of these blue dots. And that's uh, very um, uh, descriptive of basophilic stippling. Whereas Pappenheimer, you'll see, there'll be this more organized kind of pockets of okay. the inclusions. So if you see the inclusion diffuse, and spread uh, evenly throughout the cell, it's likely basophilic stippling. Yep, absolutely. <clears throat> Ooh, buggies, <laughs> blood bugs. Um, so yeah, uh, this is a, um, a blood parasites. These are what, an amoeboid blood parasite transmitted by uh, mosquitoes? Usually. Yeah, usually, right? Or, yep, or ticks, right? So as is endemic here in uh, New England, we'll see Babesia mm -hmm. um, transmitted by a tick bite. And if, uh, if it is in fact malaria, um, an Anopheles mosquito, I think I yep. remember from my <laughs> um, But yeah, these are generally like a blue ring uh, yep. trophozoite with a purple chromatin dot. Yeah, and it, this will depend on your institution, but usually when we're just doing a differential and we see them, blood parasites are present, mm. right? And then they get speciated. So the speciation could either happen in a micro lab where they speciate or a specialty area of hematology where they speciate. It'll just depend on the clinical lab that you are in, but somewhere we'll speciate it, but typically just a, a 
you know, a technologist doing a diff is going to say blood parasites are present. Yep. All right, so the next thing that we have are Cabot rings. Cabot rings you don't see very often at all. I think uh, I may have seen one or two in all the years I've done this. Yeah, uh, same. I haven't seen them very often. Uh, basically, they're remnants of microtubules that were mitotic spindles. And they're generally associated with uh, things that have erythrocyte production issues. So whenever you're looking at the megaloblastic anemias, occasionally lead poisoning, uh, the MDSs, things like mm. that, that's when yeah. you're in a C cabot range. Maybe. Yep. Maybe, yeah. <laughs> <clears throat> <clears throat> ah, the corocytes, also known as target cells. Target cells, right? Yeah, you'll see us uh, reference them as you'll see med techs, med, med lab scientists uh, reference them as target cells probably a lot. Um, so, corocytes, the the names says it all, I guess. Um, <laughs> and just generally, you have. Uh, like less hemoglobin inside of the cell and then you get this kind of like incomplete fill sort of um uh, visual picture i guess yeah, and it looks like a target yep. yep so they're generally associated with the hemoglobinopathies like sickle cell hemoglobin sc mm -hmm. things that we have we've talked about in other videos thalassemias right yeah yep, now. The cryocytes. <laughs> or teardrops. Um, not much to say here, except that uh, it is possible that you'll see some red cells that have been kind of distorted during the smear making process, making a very, very fine point. And if you see that that fine point is all facing in the same direction, it's likely artifacts. True dacryocytes, so true teardrops, usually have a roundedness to the, uh, the, the tear part of it. Yeah. Or here, mm -hmm. <clears throat> excuse me, or here, where it almost looks like a little balloon piece where at the bottom you have that little balloon portion where you blow it up and then tie it off. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> and then notice how, like Dave said, this one's facing in this direction, that one's facing in that direction. So they're more likely to be true teardrop cells than an artifact. For panocytes. Panocytes, yes, uh, our beloved sickle cells. Yep. Um, yeah, I, I, you know, they can be anywhere from a bit elliptocytic to full on, um, you know, sickle uh, shapes. Uh, most of the time, generally, they'll have this kind of deep red coloration to them. Uh, due to the dehydrating nature of the physiology that's going on in the cell, really concentrates the hemoglobin. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Sickle cells. Ah, so I referenced uh, echinocytes relative to acanthocytes. These would be echinocytes. They have these short, even projections across the periphery of the cell. Yep, and they're relatively even the whole way around. Yeah. <clears throat> Unlike the acanthocytes that had uneven projections. Some were long, some were wide. So that's one of the big differences, acantho, echino. The, uh, the echinocytes also could be artifact on a slide. So it's entirely possible you make a slide and whether it's the particular spot on the slide or whatever's going on, you could have a bunch of echinocytes in a field, but then look at other fields and see that there's none. So when we say look at five to 10 fields, right? When your instructors are telling you, um, that's, the, that's why it's important is you might see something in one area and it's not representative of what's physiologically happening to the patient. Yep. Absolutely. Yeah, and echinocytes are sometimes called burr cells. Yes. Hey, elliptocytes. Elliptocytes. So I think it's important just to say that sometimes elliptocytes and ovalocytes are lumped into one. 
yeah. classification and sometimes they're two separate classifications so we'll talk about both of them here elliptos and ovalos just so that we have completeness of ellipticides versus ovalocytes we're lucky to have both in this field right we got a <laughs> we have examples of, of each so um, this center arrow is pointing towards a very good ellipticite. Um, and I think having, uh, I generally define the ellipticite as having sides that are near parallel or parallel to one another. Um, and then the ovalocyte is, uh, well, I, I have less scientific uh, descriptions for ovalocytes. It's like an egg. Yeah, it's more like an egg. It's a little bit uh, and rather than having those parallel edges, they're almost like bowed a little bit where you have some fluffiness to it, kind of like this guy Fluffy. here. I like that fluffiness. <laughs> yeah, so like this where it's, you know, it's not parallel. It's a little bit fluffier, but that's more of an ovalo versus an ellipto. Mm. So depending on where you are, you may lump them together and call them one, or you may call them two separate things. Hemoglobin C crystals. Mm. So similar to the trypanosites, the color is like a real, I think it was like the first thing that I notice about uh, this particular field. Very, very deep, rich red. Yep. Um, yeah. Contrary to an avalocyte, the shape, right? The shape, uh, excuse me, contrary to a trypanosite, um, <laughs> the, the shape, these, these shapes are pretty characteristic. Yeah, there's a nice rectangle in like this guy here where you have this nice, it, it's similar to an ellipto in that you have these parallel edges. It looks like a nice, perfect rectangle. The only thing is that's all the hemoglobin concentrated to one area. And then you can see that the outline of the red cell membrane actually goes all like this. You just can't see it very clearly. You can see a little bit more clearly in this one uh, because what gives color to our erythrocytic membrane? Hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is what gives coloration to everything. So if all of your hemoglobin is concentrated into this rectangle, you're not going to be able to see the membrane. And unlike an elliptocyte, this is a crystal. Mm -hmm. Where an elliptocyte is just a shape, you have a variation in shape. This is actually a crystalline formation inside of the erythrocyte. Mm -hmm. And ovalocytes are like, and elliptocytes can be a bit nondescript, right? There can be a bunch of different conditions. Yep. If we see a hemoglobin C crystal. Then it's hemoglobin CC. It's yep. hemoglobin C disease. Yep. You're not going to see C crystals in hemoglobin AC or hemoglobin C trait. You're only going to see it in C disease. So it's very specific. And you don't see them very often, hence why we don't have a video for it. But we do have one for SC. Uh, this is one of Melissa's favorites, huh? This is my favorite one. <laughs> so yeah, SC, you kind of get like this weird in between, right? It's not quite C. It doesn't look quite like C. Um, and influenced by the S. And you get these kind of weird. Um, yeah, you get these weird ones. A lot of them look like this, where they're trying to do the hemoglobin C thing, but they just kind of oddly do it and they don't get a nice rectangle. They just kind of get a mosh or like this guy here, same thing. Or sometimes you get these, which I really like where you have hemoglobin to two ends and the, the clearing in the center. So, and this photo was taken on 40X, not a hundred. So that's why you can see a little bit more of the field, but that's what you, and you, you should evaluate on a hundred, not 40. This is probably one of the most difficult ones for me to even describe to someone, right? To, um, I think I have like a spiel for most red cell morph. SC crystals are kind of weird. They're a little unique. Yeah, yeah, different shapes. Sometimes they make really odd shapes. Sometimes they do funky things, but it's not hemoglobin SS because there's no drapanocytes. And you would see a load of drapanocytes in the field if it was SS. Mm -hmm. Because it's SC, you may see I drapanocyte, but for the most part, you're going to see these SC crystals, codocytes, and that's about it. Yep. <clears throat> Yay! Every time <clears throat> I think of Howl Jolly Body, I just think of the Christmas season. <laughs> it's just. Have a holly jolly. <laughs> I don't know. 
So yeah, these are, um, I think one of the easier include, personally, uh, the easier inclusions to distinguish. Yep. Um, the Hubble Jolly body representing like a fragment of DNA um, from the new, from the previous, the previous, I can't formulate thoughts today. <laughs> <laughs> comparing to like basophilic stippling and, and things like that yeah definitely <clears throat> usually there's only one occasionally there's two in a cell but usually you only have one and you don't really need to play with the fine tune because they're usually there and prominent and they're also like usually quite pretty right they're really really round they're really really smooth um not all the time but uh many times they're they're like this it's like a perfect sphere perfect yeah. circle yep mm. we're at a say <laughs> everybody kind of who works in the field is like a karate say <laughs> <laughs> what <laughs> So um, there's a there's probably a lot of co colloquial kind of yeah. names and, and ways to describe this. Would, would like helmet cell be helmet. kind of Yeah, I think helmet's the best way to think about it. Yeah, yeah I think <laughs> of like the old army helmet, like the Saving Private Ryan, World War II, yeah. you know, the helmet with the straps. Um, yeah. Yeah, totally. And, and you're going to see that in things where there's been a little chunk taken out. It's almost like you took a bite of this whole area and removed it. Would it be uh, like hemolytic type disorders, uh, most likely? Yeah. yeah. Paps. Paps. I love this in Paps. Um, so yeah, uh, Pappenheimer's, this is where I wanted to contrast them against the uh, like basophilic sibling. So here you have more of these localized pockets mm -hmm. of this blue um, staining uh, precipitated iron, I guess. Um, so, yeah, yeah. So just notice it's not everywhere. Right. And this right here, these three together, is like the classic. All your atlases are going to show you. This is what Pappenheimer bodies look like. But this is also, this is also, these mm -hmm. are also, mm -hmm. like, this is what Pappenheimer bodies will look like. They'll be different in each cell and each patient that you look at. It's not always this classic triad of the Pappenheimer mm -hmm. granules together. Yep, yep. Yeah, takes a fine eye to pick them up sometimes. And again, sometimes you need to play with the, the fine tune. Mm -hmm. All right, polychromasia. So polychrome, multiple colors or many colors in our cell. So a little bit of blue, a little bit of red, mm -hmm. and we get this kind of like purpley kind of, uh, you know, color. And generally this, these represent our, uh, would you say the shift retics, the stress uh, retics that one might put out recovering from an anemia or something like that. Yep. Um, and classically overcalled um i would say too generally in my experience yeah you really want to stick to your grading schema that you're given by whatever institution you're at is it five to ten per field is it one to five per field and you really want to call that i, I know some techs will be like hey there's one in this field i'm calling it so you always want to make sure you're following whatever your grading schema is and again whatever is consistent in the peripheral blood smear, not just you see it in one field. Yep. Yep. Yeah. Ah, there we go, a rouleau. Yep. So um, rouleau, stack of dimes, mm -hmm. uh, I think pretty self-explanatory. Um, one of the pitfalls of rouleau is that if you're in the wrong area on the slide, you can have an artifact that appears to be real low. Um, so always be careful you're in the right spot. Yep, absolutely. And this is caused just by a buildup of protein, which is different from agglutination, yep. which is antigen antibody interaction. So again, you're telling the physicians two very different things when you call agglutination or real low. Yep. <sighs> Schistocytes. There's a nice one right here. Mm -hmm. So schistocytes usually represent an intravascular hemolytic process. So a whole red cell becomes sheared and ripped to pieces, and you have a fragment of a red cell. 
Um, so what shape are they? Who knows, right? So that's where we have to be, um, you know, uh, and, and this is where, it, you know, it's certainly difficult to distinguish an acanthocyte and, and schistocyte. Um, and would you say like size, like the, the size ends up being the main thing, right? Like, right. Um, yeah, because an acanthocyte is a whole cell. Right, right. Schistocyte is a fragment of a cell. So mm -hmm. just, when you're thinking, is it a schisto or a cantho? Just keep that in mind. Is it a whole cell? Cool. Spherocytes. So how do I see a sphere in a two-dimensional image, right? So, <laughs> um, so my spherocytes, I end up being... Uh, I, I, I guess I tend to fall on like the more conservative side when it comes to calling spherocytes. So I'm really looking for a perfectly round red cell with like a, a, a richness in the red, kind of like a, um, yeah, and, and there's absent central pallor, right? So if a cell has central pallor, can it be a sphero spherocyte? <laughs> I don't usually call spherocytes with a central pallor. Yeah. I think it depends on what your institution trains you on mm. a spherocyte, the definition of a spherocyte is. Mm. I think usually spherocytes don't have a central pallor, but maybe there's a minor. Like, is this a spherocyte? Mm. So it really depends on, on how your institution trains you. It cannot have a sizable, nice, defined, really clear central pallor that takes up one third of the cell. No. Right, right. But something like that. That depends on your institution, mm. um, but usually you're right. They don't have a central power. Mm. And just be careful you're not in a thin part of the field because mm. the closer you get to the feathered edge, the more these cells look like spherocytes and it's just the, the area you're in on the slide. That's a good point. Those pitfalls. Mm -hmm. It just takes practice and experience. And last but not least are stomatocytes. Somatocytes are pretty cool. I think they kind of look like buttons, like buttons on a shirt or something, you know? Um, and, and they're actually really fascinating. The closer you look at them and the, the more careful you are with um, visualization, you can kind of see them like, they're like a, like a bun, like a baked bread bun, kind of like the way that they, uh, I don't know, I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. <laughs> Stomatocytes have this like, kind of slitted central power. The, the typical comparison is a coin slot. So like the ah, piggy yeah. bank or something, it's a coin slot where you can just stick a coin in. Mm -hmm. But you don't see stomatocytes very often. No, not really. You may see it. So correct me if I'm wrong, Melissa. Um, sometimes a laboratory might do an albumin preparation and you can see these as artifacts. Am yeah. I? Yes. Yep, absolutely. On the albumin smear, which is why if you use albumin smears, you don't do red cell morphology on the albumin smear because you're typically going to see stomatocytes. But they're artifacts just from the excess protein, that excess albumin is kind of really holding your cells together and squishing that central power to look like a coin slot. So you're right. So on albumin, you'll definitely see it. But traditionally, just doing regular non-albumin peripheral blood smears, you don't see them very often. All right, so I think what we've covered today is the majority of the different morphological uh, variations that most laboratories will call. There may be some slight variations, like for example, bizarre cells. Bizarre cells are really not in any textbook I've ever seen, but some institutions may call them if they don't fit into any other category kind of thing, or there may be other names for these, like keratocytes are typically helmet cells, but for the most part, the, this is the, the majority of the different morphological variations that we see in the clinical lab. Mm -hmm. Yep, I think it's very representative in my experience. Yep. All right, well, that's all there is for this video. So thanks for watching. Yeah, thank you. Please like, subscribe, and hit the bell if you'd like notifications whenever we post a new video. And feel free to reach out to us on social media or via email with comments or suggestions about future content. Thanks.